wanted to take like the Christian faith, if you want to take the message and you wanted to put it into just a chapter, this would be it. Okay, because as we're going to see, again, it starts with the, sort of the bookends of there's no, now con, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. In other words, we have this new standing with God that means that we're free. Okay, and then on the other side, at the bottom, we're going to see when we get there, there's nothing that can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus. So whatever's happened to you, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, wherever your feet have taken you, None of those places can take you away from him. None of those things that have happened to you can do that. His love is greater than that. And so sandwiched in here in this text is, well, then okay, what does this mean? How do we live out of this? Okay, and that's where we are sort of in the, toward the beginning of this chapter today. I'm going to read. You'll find an outline in your program. Hopefully I'll stay on track here and reach the destination as we sort of move toward the end. And you'll see where this is going. We're in a really important teaching section of this chapter. This is the Word of God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, That even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, how is it that you've shown us so much in Christ, and yet, Lord, being able to sense that connection, to know that we belong to you because of Jesus. Father, that's so difficult for us. And we know, Lord, it's not because you're not willing. We know that you are. But it's because, Lord, there's so much we have experienced. There are so many places we have been. We live in fear and doubt. We live in guilt with questions. And, Lord, you pierce that with the love of Jesus. But, Father, we we still find it difficult to believe, to trust, to lean into you and your presence. So, So help us today, Lord. Reveal yourself to us, and Lord, lead us on the path of life, for we pray together in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this, this week was a really great week for Sandy and for me, and by the way, I have a confession to make. I haven't been wearing my wedding ring for like over a couple of years now. Now, it's not what you think, you guys, Okay. Here's a picture of Sandy and myself from like our former life when I was, I won't tell you how many pounds lighter, and my wedding ring would actually fit on my finger. You see, it got so tight, I just couldn't wear it anymore. One day it cut my finger, I took it off, and I actually tried one of those, have you seen those latex, they're sort of like rubber latex? I tried wearing those, but they feel cheap, and mine kept falling off all the time, so I just quit wearing it. So this past week was our wedding anniversary, and my wife never lets me give her gifts for these events. Note to other wives in the room, this is really amazing, right? My wife doesn't ask for gifts, and actually she said you could reuse the cards, because I don't remember what card you gave me last year. Um, So what I did was I was like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to get a new wedding ring. And so I went and I purchased a new wedding ring. You'll see it here in the box, okay? And my plan was, I'm going to slip this on on the day of our anniversary. We're going to be spending the day up together in Vera, where my dad is, and just let her discover it. It'll be a beautiful moment. She will see how much I value our marriage and how much I want people to know 
that we really are married. So an interesting thing happened. 2 a.m. in the morning, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I thought, oh, this is the perfect time. So I hunted down the ring. I put it on my finger. The next morning, we go out to breakfast, and I'm thinking, she's going to notice. This is going to be sweet, right? And, I'm, and, and she doesn't notice, so I'm being really obvious, like, you know, <laughs> you, you know. The whole day, she goes through the whole day, and she never notices. We drive back to Miami, and here's what happened. No kidding. This is exactly what happened. We're, we're going to go to bed shortly. She walks into our bathroom. She looks into the soap dish, and she sees one of those latex wedding rings that I tried to wear, and she walks out, and she sort of confronts me, and she says, this is what she says, honey, I, I think it would be nice if you would wear a wedding ring. And so I look at her and I say, and just where would I wear a wedding ring if I had one? Like, look over here. It's actually on my finger. And even then she didn't look and see. And so when I sprung it on her, we had all kinds of laughs together. It's like, I was wearing this all day. <laughs> oh, those, you know, anniversary gifts, right? <laughs> now let me tell you, the reason I bring that up <laughs> is because you also have a wedding ring if you belong to Christ and you don't even know that you're wearing it. You don't know that you have it. It has gone totally unnoticed in the lives of much fo most followers of Jesus. It goes unnoticed and unappreciated. Some people have called this the wedding ring of your faith. But we don't mention it. And you don't notice its presence. You say, what is he talking about? I'm talking about the Spirit of God, and the Spirit is not an it. The Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, fully God. In our text today, the Spirit of God is referred to as the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And as you read Scripture, you will find all these wonderful titles like Counselor, Helper, Comforter, and you may notice as you read these, these are what we call supporting roles, not leading roles. The counselor assists you, right? It is not that he is not there for himself or herself. By the way, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is always referred to as feminine. The word is feminine in Hebrew. In the New Testament, the word is neuter. It really has no gender. But God's people down through the ages have often referred to the Holy Spirit as she, you might say. And let me tell you a little bit about her. She's very shy. She's not interested in promoting herself. Her total goal is to promote in your life the presence and life of Christ. Sort of like those floodlights out front that shine light on our building in the night. The goal of a floodlight isn't to draw attention to itself, but it's to cast the light on that which it desires to illuminate and draw your attention to. You see, the Spirit is less interested in promoting herself than in nudging you toward Christ. Every person who comes to Christ by faith is given the Holy Spirit. So if you've received Christ, you have the Spirit. Listen to Paul writing the Ephesian Christians. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, that's that wedding ring, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So what the Spirit is, is like being given the title to the estate before you get home. It's the guarantee of the fullness of what is to come providing God's presence and proof every day that you belong to the Lord. But, but here's the problem. Because the spirit is shy and has a helping role, you usually miss her. You don't even recognize she's in your life and in you. I remember years ago I was impacted, I, probably after high school, because I had to read some of the works of Leo Tolstoy. He's a Russian author. Here's a picture taken of him in his 90s. You may not know, or you may, that he came to faith a little later in life. He came to know Christ. He said, I've lived in the world 55 years, and for 35 years of my life, I was a nihilist in the sense of one who believed in nothing. Five years ago, I came to believe in the doctrine of Christ. 
and my whole life underwent a sudden transformation. Now, he, as he read Scripture, was especially drawn to the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, he studied it and studied it over again. And he said, if a person could live this way, if this could be their life, it would be, it would be radical. And he sought out to do that. But there was always a missing piece. Listen to this statement of his wife. There is so little warmth about him. His kindness does not come from his heart, but merely from his principles. In other words, yeah, I think he's learned about that, but it's not really at work in him. He doesn't really love me, and he doesn't love our kids. And he knew this, by the way. He said of himself, it's true, I've, I've not fulfilled one thousandth of a part of them, and I'm ashamed of this, I'm unable to. And you want to shout out, well, of course you can't. None of us can live the Sermon on the Mount. But what he had missed was the presence of the Spirit of God. And you see, we're being told in our text today, if, if we're to have this life in Christ, we need to understand how the Spirit works. We, we need to participate in this life in the Spirit to have what we've been given in Christ, to enjoy what we've been given. And so that's what I want to look at with you today, what our, our new life in the Spirit. Now, as I mentioned, this amazing chapter has these incredible bookends. The beginning, as I said, begins, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So right now, wherever you are, if you belong to Christ, you're not condemned. God isn't heaping guilt on you. He's not looking in judgment upon you. You're not under some kind of curse. You are free from all of that. But the following words explain through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And I want to know, what is this law of the Spirit who gives life? Well, first you should realize what this means is that it's not on your own efforts. He says this life of living before God, not condemned, doesn't happen because you're now saying, I'm going to really work hard at this. I'm going to enhance my abilities. I'm going, to, I'm going to make this happen. Look, you couldn't save yourself to begin with. Jesus had to do that. And only Jesus could do that, can continue to do this work in you. He died for you, were forgiven and given a new life. And so living this life is not going to be on your own strength or your own abilities. You will become frustrated if you try to do it this way. But it will be based on the work of His Spirit to apply the cross of Christ, the love of Christ in your life every day. And so here Paul in this section today is explaining two things that we really need to understand as we're living this life. First, the way the Spirit works. I think I would like, I don't know if you're like me, I would love God, the Holy Spirit, to just wave this divine magic wand and just immediately solve all the things that I struggle with. So I don't struggle with them anymore to really fix me and make me as I was meant to be to begin with. But it doesn't work that way. Paul contrasts, he basically says there's this tension between the way of the flesh and the way of the spirit. He says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. So he says, look, you, you got to get it like this. It's as if you're becoming the citizen of a new kingdom. Now, I listen to people who become citizens here, and they talk about what is it like to now inhabit another place and really to become a part of that. It, it takes time, doesn't it, to make us this way as God has meant us to be. It's not with our own effort. And he uses the word flesh not to talk about our bodies like our bodies are something evil, but to talk about the remnants, you might say, or the leftovers of our life apart from God. Those desires that continue to assert their pressure on you. I like to think about it like this. Imagine your life is like this factory that's along this very beautiful river. Isn't that a beautiful river? I think it's in uh, the, uh, the Allegheny River here in this country. And imagine your flesh, as he describes it here, your life is like this. But sadly, this river, I mean this plant has dumped toxic waste into that river. And so much of it, and by the way, it's been pouring down there for a long time in your life, so much so 
that fish have died. And the birds that used to come and, and feed along the river, they don't come in there anymore because it's now filled with death. It's, it's polluted. It's poisonous, really. And the beauty of the river, your own beauty, has been damaged by this too. Sad and tragic, as I said. And this is the story of our lives. Now, when you come to faith in Christ, what Jesus says is this. Well, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to turn off the spigot of the pollution that's coming into your life. I'm going to take care of that myself. I'm going to take away the power of sin in your life. But you know what you have? Like that river, all of this pollution has gotten down into the sediments. It's now coated on those rocks. And it's going to take a long time with, with clean water flowing down that river before all of those sediments and, and all of those things are washed away. And this is what God does in our lives through his spirit. He now begins to pour fresh water and life into your lives, the love of Jesus and forgiveness and assurance and peace and joy and, and really all God's gifts and soon, soon your life is beginning to change. The stream begins to wake up and have life. But by the way, it's going to take a long time because there's a lot of stuff down in there. And you know about this because it's in your life. You see, this is why the Spirit is going to work slowly through your whole lifetime. So Scripture talks about this as, as a process but you will again see life reappear. You will see a growing love for Christ, an interest in walking with God. It will, again, it's going to take time. You, and by the way, you may get discouraged and you may even wonder, I wonder if this change is even happening in me. And if God is working and his life is returning. But one day birds are going to show up and you're going to say, wow, some cool things are happening here. I begin to see my heart changing in all of this. I, one day Bono was being talked about his own spiritual life, and he, he explained it like this. I like his explanation. Your nature is a hard thing to change. It takes time. I have heard of people who have life-changing, miraculous turnarounds, people set free from addiction after a single prayer, relationships saved where both parties let go and let God. But it was not like that for me nor is it for most people, I would say. For all that, I was lost, I am found. It's probably more accurate to say, I was really lost, and I'm a little less so at the moment. And then a little less, and a little less again. That to me is the spiritual life, this slow reworking, rebooting the computer at regular intervals, reading the small print of the service manual. It has slowly rebuilt me in a better image. It's taken years though, and it's not over yet. Yeah, your nature is hard to change. And so God every day is like, I want to dump love into your life, and I, I want to pour forgiveness into your heart. I want you to learn this. And this is why you need the Spirit of God. You need constant reminders of God's love. You need a, a daily immersion in his word of encouragement. Listen to Listen to Paul, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Don't you love that? He said, okay, think about it like this with me. You know that Jesus was raised from death to life? And you now have the spirit of Jesus alive in you, and guess what he plans on doing in you? He's going to raise you up. He has to. This is who he is. This is what Jesus is about. And you now have his spirit. What happened to him is going to happen to you. And you say, well, what happened? What will happen? Well, the spirit wants to do this work and will do this work of inner transformation. Now, we need to understand this part too because I think we live frustrated because we don't understand it. It's not like you're going to learn new techniques. I'm not going to teach you that. Yes, as you follow Christ, you will learn to pray. Hopefully, you will learn to love to read Scripture. You will find practical ways to serve Christ and so on. But don't be deceived by this. That is sort of trying to change the inside by doing stuff on the outside. And what God has done in you, this work that he's begun, is all an inside job. You see, you're not going to change your own life. 
The things that God, you know, what is, where God is calling us is to the Spirit's power and presence. It's the Spirit of God who changes us. It's an inner transformation. I, I, I like to think of it like this. It is more a Spider-Man thing than a Batman thing. You ever notice these superhero guys? You're into the superheroes. You are totally going to get this. These two, pers- two superheroes come about their powers in completely different ways. First, there's Batman. Here he is. He is rich, right? And he's actually physically pretty strong, but he doesn't have any superpowers. And so you know what he does? He uses his money like a superpower, and he buys all kinds of gadgets and gizmos. He uses all kinds of technology, right? And his power comes from that, from external possessions, Gadgets, really. But Spider-Man is like the opposite. He's completely different. He's not rich, and he doesn't have any gadgets at all. Actually, he was bitten by a spider, a radioactive spider. And his nature changed, and now he has that power inside of him. He doesn't need to try hard. He only needs to learn how to live with and use his new powers. You see, Christ gives us everything that we need. We don't need gadgets. It's not something we make happen to ourselves to make our lives work better. He is transforming us from within. He gives you a new nature. And the job of the Spirit is to teach you how to live into that new nature, to live with the new power that you've already been given fully in Christ. Activate these powers so to speak. So let me tell you this. If you're trying to create your own powers like Batman, you're going to get frustrated. You are not going to come up with enough techniques. There are no three steps to this. There's no things that you can do to make this work for yourself. There's nothing that can accomplish what Jesus has done at the cross. There are no techniques that will get you there. There is only the Spirit of Jesus who can train you to live out of your new nature. Here again. But if Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, right? Because of Jesus, his love, his goodness, his faithfulness, they all become yours through the presence of the Spirit of God. And this is this inner work of transformation. You say, well, how does the Spirit do this? How does the Spirit accomplish this transforming work in me. What does the Spirit do exactly? And this is the second thing we need to understand. Remember, the Spirit is sort of like that wedding ring. I'm wearing it now. Reminding us that we belong to Christ. Constantly showing us Jesus and leading us into this truth. And if you read our text, it's really sort of filled with this. The Spirit of God lives in you. His Spirit who lives in you. You see, the Spirit does all of her work by bringing the presence of Christ with you at all times. And this is the fulfillment of those promises of Jesus where he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You know, the disciples of Jesus struggled with this. It was on the night in which he was betrayed, he told them he was leaving, and then right away, just like that, he said, well, I'm not really leaving. And they were like, what? They were perplexed by this. He told them he was leaving and he told them he was going to be with them. And listen to what he says. He says, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That's another one of those titles, right? One of those helping roles. The the Spirit of God is is your advocate and is also the, the advocate of Jesus Jesus continues, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he makes, what he will make known to you. He says, look, it's all coming from me. The presence of the Spirit is like my presence in your life every day. So the goal of the Spirit is to bring all the riches of Christ, the love of Christ, the presence of Christ, everything that Christ has done for you to you and your life every day by being present. The Spirit makes Christ present in and with us. 
Years ago, a priest named Bill Kane is his name. This story touched me because of where I am in my life with my dad right now. He's in a skilled nursing facility. He'll never live independently again. And I just love going to be with him. And Bill's dad was sick. Here's Bill. He's, he's a priest, and he stepped away from his ministry for a while just to hang out with his dad. And he would do stuff for his dad during the day while his dad was resting and napping and stuff like that. But every evening they had sort of a routine. Bill would sit with his father and read to his father until his father fell asleep. He would read out loud out of a novel. And Bill, by the end of the day, was exhausted. And as he was reading to his father, he would realize, my father's looking at me. He's not trying to fall asleep. And so he said to his dad, look, the idea, here's the idea. I read to you, and you fall asleep. And his father would apologize. He would close his eyes. And then Bill would notice his dad's eye would pop open. And he would just be looking at him with one eye. And Bill would catch him. He'd say, come on, come on, go to sleep, go to sleep. And this would go on night after night after night until finally his dad said, it means so much that you're with me that I, I'm not going to take my eye off of you. I thought about that and I thought, that's what Jesus is doing with his disciples, right? He says, I'm leaving you guys, but I'm not, I would never leave you. I'm, I'm never going to forsake you. Not only that, I'm giving you my spirit, and my spirit is going to live in you, and, and it's going to represent me in all things, and it's going to continue to tell you how much I love you and, and lead you into my truth. And this is the transforming power, transforming us to be like Jesus every day because we have his spirit. You see, this is where life is going to come from, and it's, it's how the river gets cleaned up in your life. It's not because you go on a, a project to get rid of all the trash. It's because every day God is there through Jesus and the spirit saying, you belong to me in your mind. Don't forget that. Whatever you do today or whatever happens to, to you today, remember I, you're mine. And that begins to transform us. And you say, well, okay, okay, I, I have the Spirit. And that's amazing. And you're right, I haven't noticed him. I haven't even paid attention to the Spirit's presence. But what's my part? What do I do with the Spirit? I mean, if you've given me the spirit, am I a robot? Don't, don't I get to participate to enjoy in this work that God is doing in my life? Listen to Paul again. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now that verse hung up on me because it says, if by the Spirit. Will you keep it up there, Juan Luis? Well, maybe not. But here we go. If, by the, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death. Well, I thought Jesus was doing all of this. What do you mean I'm putting to death? I, didn't, I thought God is doing all of this for me. Well, you see, Paul is describing this, this way that the Spirit and you work together. That, that, that's what it is. As if you have to learn the Spirit of God is with you, and then you begin to cooperate in this work. You engage. You invite the work of the Spirit, and you come to rest in the Spirit. You're looking to Christ in everything. And so here is the Spirit inviting you into the fullness of Christ. Let me explain it like this. A few years ago, I encountered the work of this incredible horseman. If you've never seen any of his work, it is absolutely amazing. His name is Monty Roberts. He is the original guy called the horse whisperer. He grew up around horses because his dad was in the horse business, and he learned that there's only one way to train horses. You have to break them. You have to break their spirits. Through domination, by the way, here's a picture of Monty. Through domination and force, it often involves a whip. In some places, they actually abuse the horse because until the animal reaches the conclusion that total submission is the only way to survive, it will, it will just fight. But here's what happened to Monty. He ended up out in the badlands of Nevada, and he just followed around wild horses, and he watched how they communicated with each other. He sort of learned their culture and learned their language, and because of that, he, realized, he learned, you don't have to do that to get a horse to cooperate with you. That's not necessary at all. 
And as a result, drawing on everything he learned, he can take in 30 minutes a completely untamed horse out of the wild and in 30 minutes have a saddle on it and a person riding around without a whip and no violence at all. Well, you say, how does he do this? Well, he knows the language of horses, and I'm going to show you in just a minute. But the first, he begins by saying something like this, I'm not going to hurt you, and you don't have to follow me if you don't want to. I'm not going to hurt you. You don't have to come with me. You don't have to follow me. But he brings the horse, and he puts it into a round corral. You'll see a, a picture of this scene. And the horse stays as far away from him as it can over by the wall. And he just has a little rope he can fling out there. He doesn't hurt the horse. He's just making contact with it. And the horse starts to look at him. And as soon as he starts to see that horse pull away from the wall a little closer to him, he knows that a weak bond has begun to form. And it's really amazing to watch if you get a chance to see it. And at some point, when he sees that horse beginning to step a little bit further away from the wall, he does something really amazing. He takes his eyes off the horse and he turns and he starts walking away from it like that. And do you see what the wild horse does? And within just a few moments, if he keeps walking, that horse will come up and bring his nose right to his shoulder. Now that horse was in the wild. And it didn't have to be broken at all. You see, there's a moment when that horse stops and turns and walks toward his back. And there's a moment of decision of saying... Am I going to follow him or not? Do I want to cooperate with him or not? Do I want to be in relationship with him or not? And you know what it's called? It's not called breaking a horse. It's called joining up. Joining up. Now, when I heard about that, I thought, that, that's God's way, isn't it? He's, he doesn't wrestle you to the ground and say, you got to do what I say, and, and you're going where I lead. Because what cannot be done by force can only be done by the wonder of connection. And when I read passages about the Holy Spirit, this is what the Spirit of God is doing with us. He is not going to force you. He's not going to control you in that way. And by the way, that's why the language in Scripture is almost always passive. Listen to it again. If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds, it's passive, isn't it? By the Spirit, this can happen. When you join up with him. Now, why doesn't he tell us that the spirit just takes control and and he's going to manhandle you and he's going to make you walk straight? Remember, this isn't the spirit. The spirit is shy. We're told elsewhere in the New Testament, walk by the spirit and, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in in step with the Spirit. What it's saying is, is you're learning to walk in response to the Spirit. He's going to lead you away from death and toward life. And and the river of your life is going to be cleaned up. The Spirit dwells in you, but it's not forcing you. And, And let me tell you why. You know what happens when I try to force my wife? It's not pretty, I can tell you. Do you know what happens when she tries to force me? I don't want to tell you about that. And you see, God is in relationship to you. That's what the ring is all about. It's not that little circle on my finger. It's the fact that we're going to walk together. What what we've learned is, well, we're not trying to force each other or fix each other. God will lead us to walk to some amazing places together. And that's the way it is with the Spirit of God in you. So the Spirit is saying, will you, will you come and walk with me? This is why God does it in this way. Because God really wants you. He wants to be walking in communion with you, in loving relationship with you. And this is why Jesus came and what is offered to us in Christ and why keeping in step with the Spirit is all about life. So the question today is, you know you're married? You know you have the wedding ring? If you've trusted in Christ, you already have the Spirit. And the Spirit every day is like, can we walk together? Because I'm going to lead you in places. I'm going to teach you about God's love for you in Christ. That is my sole purpose in being here. Not attempting to do this in my own power, because that leads to frustration. I know I can't do it. But enabling me to live out of God's grace every day. 
Father, you're amazing. When we think of who you are as our God, we so much try to force other people to do what we want. And somehow we think that that can be for good, that that's going to work. And Lord, you created us for yourself. You know us. And it's your desire in Jesus to show us such love, such compassion toward us that we wouldn't want to think of anything else than walking with you. And Lord Jesus, you gave us your Holy Spirit because you're determined that the work you began in us through the cross, you would carry on out of your love. And in this way of grace, you would every day lead us on the way to life. Lord, help us to see this. Help us to see that as our loving Savior, this is the way you work. And Lord, some of us are running. We've always felt like your way was force. Or maybe if you led us, you wouldn't lead us where we want to go. But Father, we know that you love us more than we even love ourselves. And you certainly know us better than we know ourselves. And we know that your way is life. And so Father, I pray that you lead this people And Lord, over the years, I know we overestimate what you'll do this week, but we underestimate the transforming work of your spirit over five or ten years of walking with you. So Father, remind us, we're in process, and that's okay. It's going to take time, and that's okay too. Lord, give us the joy of knowing that no matter what, we belong to you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.